Okay. The recording has started. Okay. So thank you all for coming. Um, so um, what are we going to do today? Um, I'm just going to go through the agenda um, and then we'll talk about introductions. So we're going to do introductions. Then we're going to talk about kind of what the project's all about, what we're trying to achieve. Um, then looking at kind of what's actually happening on Route 7, because we're not starting with a blank slate. Um, as you all know, um, there are two major planning projects done in the last 10 years, both of which form a really great foundation for this work that we're doing now. Um, and then we're going to go look at a little bit more at what's actually coming up along this corridor in terms of construction and other activities. And then we're going to look at starting to prioritize. To prioritize. Um, I really want to hear from you about kind of what's going on, where to put things as we try and slot things into existing projects and also start to think about the future as well. And then at the very end, we'll talk about, a bit about next steps. Um, overall, I expect this to take about an hour and a half, um, including the discussion time, but I have set aside an extra half an hour at the end that if people want to stay online and we want to dig deeper into some of the discussion topics, we can do that if you have time. If not, I can always set up a follow up meeting um, to chat with you in more detail, but I just wanted to set aside that time so that we could dig in as much as needed. So just some meeting housekeeping. Um, if you could keep yourself muted while others are speaking. Um, that would just be really helpful. Um, if you could keep your video turned off during, until after the presentation, or just you can turn it on when you're speaking, that would be great. Um, that would just preserve bandwidth for some of the people on the call who don't necessarily have the best internet in the world. Um, if you can, you can submit questions and comments at any time in the chat box, but I'm going to kind of hold them until particular points during the presentation, um, just so that we can keep things rolling. Um, but that said, um, if there's something major going on, like you can't hear me, um, Matthew will speak up and let me know you can't hear me or some the technical issue or hey, can you just stop and explain what that term means? Um, he'll interrupt when there's something like that where I should stop and acknowledge it. Um, when it comes to the questions and comments, if you could just use the raise hand function so you can speak up or you can use the chat box, either option would be great. Um, and that will be um, that will kind of just help us to manage the flow of people. Um, and if you have any technical difficulties, as I mentioned, contact Matthew. Um, his information was in the invitation to this meeting, both his phone number and his email. So we're going to start with some introductions. What I'm going to do is we've got quite a lot of people on this call, so I don't want it to take too long in terms of time, but I'm going to go through and if you could unmute yourself and just give your name of who's here um, for each of these groups. And we're going to go in the organize the list um, that I, the order that I put on the screen right now. So first starting off with VTrans staff, um, as I said, my name is Catherine Otto. Um, I am a planning coordinator. Um, next in line, Matthew. <laughs> um, Matthew Arancio, also planning coordinator. And as Catherine mentioned, you're uh, happy tech support for today. So let me know if you have any questions. And we'll go in alphabetical order by organization. So next would be Ashley. <laughs> Yep, uh, Ashley Atkins, District 5 Project Manager, VTrans. Amy? I'm Amy Bell, I'm a Planning Manager with VTrans and I oversee our cooperative relationship with the Regional Planning Commissions and I'm the Principal Liaison to Chittenden County RPC. Matt? Hi there, uh, Matt Pergotrick. I'm a project manager in the pavement design and highway safety and design group. Um, Chris? Hi, I'm uh, Chris Clow. I do Act 250 development review and I also assist in corridor management. Great. Ian? Good afternoon. Ian DeGudis, uh, state traffic engineer with VTrans. Ross. Hello everyone, Ross McDonald, Public Transit Program Manager of VTrans. Um, Shane. Hi, yeah, sorry. I'll, uh, I'll come back in a second. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, Joe. Uh, Joe Sigali, Director of Policy Planning and Research at VTrans. Randy. Randy Snelling. The Trans District 5 technician. Stephen? Steve Stanley, District 8 technician. Great. Anyone else from VTrans who I've missed? 
Uh, yes, I'm back without a barking dog, so sorry about that. Uh, I'm Shane Warren, working the Highways Division and Asset Management Bureau, um, working with the Asset Management Team and some corridor management items in there as well. Great. Thank you, Shane. Thanks. Um, yeah. I'm uh, Jim Cota, work with District 8. Great. You're a guest. <laughs> there we go. Now I know who you are. Um, any other VTrans? Okay, um, moving on to RPC stuff. So, Northwest. Um, I'm Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, oh sorry. Go, oh, Marlena. <laughs> I'm Marlena Valenta. I'm the Climate and Energy Planner. And Bethany Remmer is also with Northwest RPC. Great. Um, Chinden County. Hi, everybody. Eleni Churchill with the uh, Transportation Program Manager at the CCRPC. I'm Jason Shrest, a Senior Transportation Planning Engineer with the CCRPC. And uh, Christine Ford, uh, Transportation Planner at CCRPC. Perfect. Good to have you all. Um, town stuff. So we'll start with Colchester, the town of Colchester. Okay, um, the town of Milton. Hi, this is David Allerton. I'm the Director of Public Works in Milton. Great to have you. And uh, this is Kirsten Jensen, engineer for the town of Milton Department of Public Works. Thank you. And the town of Georgia. Kyle Grenier, I'm the Vice President of the, or Vice Chair of the Select Board. Thank you very much, Cal. Um, Green Mountain Transit. Hi everyone, I'm Jamie Smith. I'm the Director of Planning and Marketing. Hi everyone, Chris Damiani, also from Green Mountain Transit in the Planning Department. Um, ANR, I think we've got a few people from ANR. Uh, Tom Benoit here, uh, State Stormwater Specialist. Uh, Danielle Ozarski, I'm the watershed planner. I work for Department of Environmental Conservation. Karen Bates, watershed planner with the um, Missisquoi and the uh, Basin 5 Direct, so the Mallets Bay for this area. Hi, I'm Jen Mojo. I'm senior planner in the agency's Office of Planning. Very much. Um, and then we've got, I believe we've got um, several local groups on, um, including, I, I would say at this point, anybody else who hasn't spoken, um, if you could unmute, um, that would be helpful. And just introduce yourself. Okay. Hi, my name's Kent Henderson. I'm the chair of the Friends of Northern Lake Champlain. We're involved in a unique and First of a kind collaborative effort with DEC and VTrans at the head of Deerbrook Gully. Great, thank you, Ken. Okay. Oh, Allison. Hi, Allison Spazic. Um, I'm Eco AmeriCorps member with Friends of Northern Lake Champlain. Great, good to have you. Okay, is there anyone else we've missed? Not. Thank you very much, and we'll move on. So now we're going to go over a bit of the background of what this is all about. Um, so the corridor area is spanning approximately from exit 17 to exit 18 of I-89, the stretch which is actually Route 7. Um, it's, so it's starting from the co chimney corner intersection with Route 2 um, and going just past um, Route 18, um, exit 18, just to where the library is, because I know that there was um, interest in terms of changes there in the past. Um, so that's what this corridor is looking at. It's looking at a very logical area because how do people connect? And people are often connecting into the interstate, but they're also connecting within that space. And so that's what we're doing. The reason why we've chosen to look at that area is that we have a potential slab removal project coming in the future, which is going to broadly align with that area. And we just want to make sure that we kind of understand what's going to come. And I'll speak more about that later. Um, the focus of this corridor is really focusing quite narrowly on what's within the right of way. Um, 
and kind of the area which is directly adjacent, but as it affects the right of way of Route 7. So we're not looking at all of the town roads that intersect with this. We're not looking at large stretches of Route 104A, for example. Uh, we're focusing quite narrowly on Route 7 so that we can keep this project achievable and focus on the goals. So what is the goal? Um, what, what, what we're really trying to do, um, the very kind of wordy present, um, explanation is on the screen right now. What we're trying to do is line ourselves up, looking at what kind of projects could come down the line and what kind of activities can we synchronize into upcoming projects, which we already know are coming, things that are already programmed, so things that already have pro, um, funding assigned and things which are being designed or are going to be in the near future. But also what we want to do is line ourselves up better for the future. So if there are opportunities where if we start collaborating now between the various agencies and organizations in the room today, could we make improvements to the corridor to better how it functions, how the roadway functions for all users along the roadway, whether they're in a car, they're in a truck, whether they're walking or they're cycling or using some other piece of technology which they haven't invented yet, but hopefully we have an idea of. Um, so the goal for today's um, meeting specifically is to share what we already know about the corridor, um, explain what the parameters are for doing these plans, um, looking for some input, some initial input from you as partners, and then explaining what the next steps are. So there are two guiding principles that we're trying to kind of keep in mind when we're doing these corridor management plans. One of the biggest ones I'm trying to do is keep it real and keep it actionable. There's lots of different ways to do a plan. You can write um, plans which are looking at 20 and 30 years out, which are great because sometimes you really do need to start planning 20, 30 years out from when something gets implemented. For example, the Envision I-89 project is looking at that further out time frame because they have to start working on it now and put in measures to start working on. Whereas what we're looking at here is really what can we implement in the near term? What can we work into existing projects? And where can we look for existing collaboration opportunities to get things moving in the next kind of five, 10 years, preferably kind of more on the five year frame than the 10 year frame. Um, and as part of this, we're looking at kind of identifying the needs, looking at partnerships and collaboration, because it's not just about VTrans. And um, we're also looking at creating action items and finding a way to keep it moving. So as I mentioned, it's not just about VTrans. That's really the second key thing is in order for the roadway to be successful, it's not just about VTrans paving the road. It's also about, for example, where the sidewalks are. So how the sidewalks are impacts where the crosswalks can be. So pedestrians, as they experience this space, they'll experience it differently. Or where are the bus stops and how do they fit into the pedestrian network and places where people might leave their car? Um, or where, how they're connecting into their home. And I think one of the big things about VTrans is not just VTrans to implement, but it's also not just VTrans to identify the problems. Because as local partners um, and regional partners, you know a lot more than we do in certain areas. And if we bring all of our expertise to the table, we will have a far better understanding of what is going on. So to that end, we have three different types of input. Um, we have VTrans data and stuff. Well, we've got a lot of data and we've got a lot of stuff. So we've already had 30 to 40 VTrans staff providing me with a lot of input on what they know, what they're aware of, what they've heard from you in the past. Hey, I had this conversation with so-and-so three years ago and it was really important because this formed the foundation for X, Y and Z. And so I've already started having those conversations. Now the next step is coming to you as partners. So partners are people who not only understand what's going on to a greater degree than say the general public, but you also might be part of the solution. And so that's why we're coming to you next. And then hopefully by all this information from VTrans and from the partners, we'll be ready and set up to reach out to stakeholders in the general public. So people who are traveling on the corridor every day, who live on the corridor, who work on the corridor, who own a business on the corridor, that's how we want to do it. We're kind of working down so that we are well prepared and then we can seek some really good and useful input. So the Route 9 Corridor Management Plan. We, as I mentioned, we've already started doing research. So in fall of 2021, um, I was reading the two plans that we already have for the area and also spending a lot of time talking to VTrans staff and initial conversations to work out who should be part of this conversation today. 
Um, so we did that and today we're doing the outreach and then we're going to move to in the next month or so um, moving to public facing out outreach to find out needs, concerns and what they think is going on. Um, and then later in the winter, um, we're going to review what the next steps could be according to what was found out. And then the hope is, but by mid 2022, so kind of June, July ish time, we'll have a finalized plan and we'll know roughly what to do next. Um, and that could be a do next for VTrans staff, particular parts of our agency. It could be the town needs to do X, Y, and Z, or it could be the we rec um, recognize other efforts which are going on. So um, approximately 50 needs and concerns have already been identified along the corridor. So as I mentioned before, there are two foundational plans that really have been formed the foundation of this plan so far. So um, the Route 7 Milton Corridor Study, which was done in 2016 by CCRPC with a consultant, that has some great information and you'll find out when you look at the corridor plan as it's currently written a lot of information has already been transferred into the plan into our plan we also have the georgia south village transportation master plan uh, which was completed in 2019 which is a collaboration between northwest rpc vtrans and a consultant that also has some great information which has already been transferred and I also know that some of that work is also started to be implemented. So we're starting to see projects come up where we're like, ah, the next step is not what the plan said. The next step is even further along, which is really great. It's good to hear that things are moving. So um, where, how are we doing this plan? Um, the way we've been setting up these plans is we create something called a story map. Um, a story map is an interactive map, an interactive map and website combined, really. Um, so what we do is we collate a lot of information which says this is what we see going on. And then we have an opportunity at the end to say, hey, is this something we're missing? Um, so as you navigate through the story map, you'll notice that we use a four digit code quite often to refer things back. One of the main reasons is why is otherwise it gets really confusing. Um, so for example, Danielle emailed me last week and said, hey, are you aware of this project on Deer, um, Deerbrook Gully? Um, and I was like, yes, it was, I am, 5003. That's the number, and this is what I already know about it. And she sent me additional information so I could add it in and make it all fit together. Um, we also tried to make it easy for you, including a local name. So if you know it as, like, um, down in Route 9, they had a, a corner which they called Turner's Corner. I have no idea why the history of that but I love the name and everyone knew it as Turner's Corner, so it was listed as Turner's Corner. There were no street intersections nearby, but Turner's Corner, everyone knew what you meant. So that's what I've tried to include. Um, let me know if there are any local names I've missed and I will add them in. So some information that's not yet in the corridor management plan, but will be by the end. Looking at realistically, how can we implement it? Is it kind of in the short term, the medium or the long term? Not in the traditional sense of, we're not even going to touch it for 10 years, but more in the sense of realistically, we're not going to finish implementing it for at least 10 years, um, but we're going to start thinking about next steps in the near future. We're also going to look at who's going to implement it, whether it's VTrans or somebody else, and if there are any opportunities to collaborate. So collaboration between agencies, between organizations, between the town, the regional planning commission. Let's look for opportunities and we make sure the plan assigns um, someone who's going to be the lead. So then how do we take those 50 needs that I already know about, and I'm sure there are more to come, and how do we break it down? So one of the main things I do is I look for key themes. What are the kind of repeated themes that I see over and over in a corridor? And one of the things I'm finding is there's traffic congestion and safety for this particular corridor, and then stormwater and drainage. Those two themes, it's very interesting actually, if you look at the map, one area is like one particular area and the other, there's a very little overlap between the two areas um, of town, but there's a lot of needs and concerns in those two themes. There are other themes, but those are the two big ones. And then I started collating them and said, okay, what are the major things that we're seeing over and over again? So when we look at the story map, you'll see one of some of those kind of collated goals, the ones which you see come up again. And then obviously each of the needs and concerns is individual. You can't, it's not a cookie cutter. You need to like think about the individual situation 
and what the solution might be. So we are keeping each of the needs and concerns separate, um, but we do group them at various points. So at this point, I'm going to bring up the story map, and this is where it'll start to make a bit more sense. So you can get to the story map by going to the website that I mentioned before. So go to the Milton Georgia, and then you can just say, take me to the story map. Or you can click on the story map right up here. There will be two versions of the story map by the end of the project. The version that you're seeing right now, which is where we're collecting information. And then the version at the end, which says, this is what the final results of the plan is. The final plan will, in effect, be held in the story map in the website version. So a story map, as I mentioned, is like a website. Um, so if you click on up here, um, they've got orientation, what is corridor management? Those are the different kind of information about the plan. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to skip through and show you how it works. So you'll see on this example, um, a very simple map. And you can just zoom in and zoom out um, on the bottom right hand corner. You can search for a place in the area by going top left. Um, and you always see this legend, the what's in the map. And it shows you the colors of what's in the map. If you click on it, although I don't think that one has clicking, um, this one does. If you click on the map, you should get, there we go, additional information. So this is in the background and it feeds it. Um, the idea of a story map is you can explore the data in your own time and you can explore it according to what you are interested in personally. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to skip through. Um, we've got key themes. So what's actually going on in this corridor? So creating a modal, multimodal network. I know that the town of Milton has been doing a lot of work to install and expand their sidewalk network in the last few years. Um, I also know that it's important to have bus connection along the corridor. Um, and this, these are important things. Um, and as I mentioned, traffic and conge congestion is also something which comes up regularly enough um, and people are changing their driving habits according to how congested they perceive or it actually is in a particular intersection. So I scroll through and as you can see, there's a lot of information. So what I then did was created sections which explained what we already know. So those 50 needs and concerns, I've broken it out. And you can see here we've recognized like chimney corners. There's already a project um, and that's right down here. Um, the blue line right down here. Um, and this gives you more information about what we've put into this corridor management database um, that holds all the information. And you can just go through and choose to click on whichever dots and whichever line you want. And if you go down to the bottom right of this box, it says one of six. And if you use the arrows, you can see other items in that area. And it'll highlight in turquoise when you're looking at that area. So that's how that works. Um, and I definitely encourage you to explore this in your own time and reach out if you have any questions. The same is true for um, stormwater and drainage. Um, as I mentioned, there's not much overlap between the congestion and traffic issues versus the stormwater and drainage. Very different parts of the corridor, but they are what joins the corridor together as a whole. So then the corridor management plan. At that point, I then just put everything on a map. At that point, it becomes a lot of dots and you can zoom in and we can see a lot oops, of dots on the map. And for example, this one here, this dot, I know that this one is to do with icing. Oh, no, that one is not because it hides something different. Um, there's a, this is a bridge and I know that it gets iced up at certain times um, and there's more information in the background on this. So that's one way of looking at the data. And then there's another way. Um, and I'm just going to take you to the very last part. This is the last part I'm going to show you in this. This is our public comment tool. So click anywhere to interact. Click OK. Now this is useful. So, so for example, say you care about bicycles. If you want to type in a keyword on the top left, you can type in bicycle and see every time bicycle is mentioned in a description in a need of concern so far. You could also type in culvert. Um, I know Ashley cares a lot about the culverts along 
and the roadway. Um, and she can see every time culverts are mentioned. Um, and you can just scroll through and if you click on them, it will show you where that particular point is. So and it will zoom to it. So that's how that works. And then if you have a particular thought and you want to comment on it, we'd love to hear. If you say, Ashley, you've missed something. You've identified X, Y, and Z in this problem, but there's also an additional issue from this. I'd love to hear from you. So you could, for example, you've selected this one and we comment on an existing need or concern. And what we'll do is it'll tell it which need. So it's one of these culverts and you'll fill out this little quick survey and it says basically what do you think is going on what do we need to know about um and what do you think and then it also gives you an option to just tell us who you are in case i want to follow up you do not have to provide information about who you are if you do not want to um, in addition to commenting on an existing need or concern um you can also submit a new one so we may have missed something we may not be aware of this intersection really is really bad and for some reason it's not come up in Act 250. It's not come up in an access permit. It's not come up in storm water. For some reason the district doesn't know about it um, or it didn't turn up in a planning document. But you know that this intersection is a real problem. So just put a dot on the map, submit a new need, tell us where it is and we'll we'll consider adding it in. Um, I'd love to hear if there are things that we missed. Um, it could be the concern didn't exist when the existing planning documents were created, um, what, 2016 and 2019. It could also just be that it wasn't on someone's radar. Um, and I'd love to know and make sure that we have everything on the table. So that is the story map. Please play with it. Um, I would love to hear how it goes, and I'd love to hear that you've found it useful. So that's the story mapper. So now we're going to talk a little bit more about upcoming construction projects. So we have some significant projects coming in the next few years, some of which you should already be on your radar. Um, we have the Chimney Corners project, um, which does include a section of Route um, 7, um, including reconfiguration of the intersection and the lanes. Um, in the, if you go to the PowerPoint, you can click on the link, the project back sheet to get more information. We also have the Milton Hourglass project, which is a combination project of VTrans in the town of Milton. Um, and that will in include some intersection changes along Route 7. We also have, as I mentioned, um, a slab removal project potentially coming um, in the near future. We are anticipating it's going into the budget for fiscal year 23. So it's part of the, we're hoping it's going to be part of the draft budget that comes out very shortly. Um, and we're thinking that construction would be around 2027. Um, so that's why we're planning now, because if we can get our ducks in the row, we can be ready for that project because the other it goes into design, the more likely we are to be able to consider something. The project slope um, scope includes slab removal for about eight miles of roadway. Um, the exact beginning and end points will be refined over time. Um, and to keep this project moving, this does not mean we are doing everything in the kitchen sink. Um, we are trying to keep this project moving. It involves a lot of funds, so we do. We are anticipating putting more into a project than just literally putting a new surface on the roadway. But we are trying to keep it moving and keep it nimble, which means we're staying within the existing right of way. Um, we're trying to avoid things where we're touching like lots of environmental impacts because um, that will slow down the project. There are other bigger projects where we might be able to deal with those um, and we're trying to avoid com complex environmental permits and that just helps us to keep the project moving and make it actually happen otherwise we'll never keep it going so we don't yet have a fact sheet for that because it's not fully approved because it's not in the budget yet so at this point i'm going to start we're going to start into the kind of question response and kind of discussion time um, so one of my big questions is, I've just outlined VTrans led projects, but I know that the towns and some of the other organizations are working on other projects. So for example, I think Georgia and the Friends of Northern Lake Champlain are working on the 104A area to improve stormwater. Um, Milton, I have seen a lot of plans to do a lot of sidewalk work, and I think there are other things going on. So at this point, um, feel free to unmute and let me know what's going on. Um, 
I anticipate like five, 10 minutes of discussion, and if needed, we can dig in further at other times. Hey, Catherine, there's a question in the chat from uh, Bethany just about the slab removal project specifically. So I don't know if you want to touch upon that. OK, so it's Bethany's question who says, can someone briefly explain why the slab removal project is needed? There were a lot of questions at my last TAC meeting about this proposal um, slab removal. I cannot answer that question, but I can get you an answer and I will email it back to you. Um, your TAC has a good question. Thank you, Bethany. Catherine, is that anything Matt might be able to answer? Because I mean, I'll tell you what my understanding of slab removal projects are, are all about, but, but maybe uh, Matthew could answer it better than I can. Yeah, I was, I was waiting to see if Shane was going to jump in before me, but I'm, I'm happy to give a pretty quick overview on why we do slab removal jobs. And, and Shane, feel free to correct me if, if you see that I missed something. Um, so slab removal projects are typically triggered by the pavement management system. Um, basically, the the state has a cyclical review of all the center, all the miles in in the state, um, and this program uh, takes that data, takes our budgeting, and develops recommended treatments for various projects throughout the state. Um, so typically, a, stat, a slab removal project is looking to achieve um, a particular goal. And in most cases, at least the ones that are coming through through my paving program, um, they are looking to maintain the surface condition or address surface conditions of the roadway and try to extend the longevity of that surface condition. So slab removals are, are pulling that underlying um, unmovable surface that that only breaks at a certain point in the roadway, um, which very, very quickly deteriorates that surface condition. Uh, so what we do with, with this program is we pull those slabs out and we put back in um, a new pavement surface that should last quite a bit longer. Uh, it is it's engineered for the traffic. It's basically removing slabs uh, circa the 1930s or so, uh, which have been paved over because you know not only did they deteriorate from that time frame, but they also weren't quite wide enough for the traffic that we see nowadays, which is why sometimes you see like the right hand side of the road will break off right at the edge of the slab. So what we're doing is trying to increase the the time frame that a roadway surface is tolerable for the traveling public um, as well as as uh, make some other improvements while we're while we're there where we can. That pretty well sums it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty well summed it up there. It gives us an opportunity to uh, also put in some banking and getting some other features in there that we may, some other infrastructure as well. Okay. Thank you both. Um, Dave Allerton, do you have a question, comment or answer? Yeah, I've got um, a few things to talk about here. So first of all, um, you know, I'm the director of public works in Milton, so if we, Go back to the the hourglass project. Can you show that up on the screen again? Yep. Okay, so you see the okay, you see how it's shaped as an hourglass, but down there on the left hand side of the screen, that new road. Yep. That's not gonna happen right now because we were unable to negotiate with the, the landowner over there. Yes. Okay, so um, I just wanted to make sure you were aware of that. Um, and then I had another question. How much stormwater work is going to be done along this road or along this corridor with this project? Because I know the stormwater is really pretty bad along Route 7 driving through town, especially from this hourglass area up to the top of, uh, we, all, we call it Gimlet Hill here, but by Village Drive. We did put in a couple of catch basins and you know infiltration pipes along Rebecca, the intersections of Route 7 and Rebecca Lander and Route 7 and Lamoille Terrace, and that's helped tremendously. But I just wanted to question you or or to make sure that you know adequate stormwater gets taken care of in here or, or adequate treatment, I guess. Um, my next question was you said that 
It's not in the budget yet. You said it was going to be put in the VTRANS budget for fiscal year 23. And then you said construction was going to be in fiscal year 27. Yes. Are those numbers correct? That is my best understanding from when I talked with people in November and December. OK. Stuff. So. All right. And I do know there are a couple of cross culverts across Route 7 that need some work. And I think I, I spoke with Ashley about it a couple of years ago, so um, I, I look forward to getting into your your story map there and, and going through that and making some comments in there. Yeah, so um, thank you for the additional information about the new road. I was aware of that, but when I spoke to Patty Coburn, in November time-ish, she wasn't totally sure about where things were going. So good to have that confirmation. Um, yep. Obviously, this construction information is subject to what I had when I created the presentation. Sure. And some things change. So I appreciate it's, you reminding me of that. Um, just so you know, we we offered them three hundred thousand dollars over the appraised price of that parcel there, and that was not good enough for them. So. OK, they, that's, they, that's a lot they, of money. <laughs> they, they wanted like twice the amount of the appraised value and they weren't bending. So it was like, OK, we're done here. That's good to know. Um, as to stormwater, stormwater is an interesting issue because sometimes it gets kind of to a depth in these projects. It's my understanding that we wouldn't actually get to. So slab removal is pretty shallow in terms of a treatment. Um, there is discussion though, um, but later in this presentation, there are some opportunities where we might be able to harmonize another project in with this slab removal or need to look for other opportunities. So stormwater is definitely on the radar. Um, you mentioned Lamar Terrace, you mentioned Rebecca Lander, both of those areas definitely, and a few others. Um, and I think um, later on in the conversation, we'll dig in a bit more about what might be possible and what we might need to prioritize and understand what people's priorities are. Um, and yeah, I mentioned about the time frame. So um, any further follow up questions or I'll go to the next person. No, I think I'm good there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Kathy, Kyle? Kathy, oh, Matt, just, did you want to add just something? Sorry. Really quickly, I thought I might be able to provide a little bit of clarity on the fiscal year designation. So my guess, you know, those numbers are correct, as Catherine said. Um, my guess is that the, the money that may be allocated for fiscal 23 is probably going to be only in the design aspect of, of the funding and the actual construction funding is later on. So it does seem like there's a big change there between um, between 23 and 27. In reality, it's likely that the funding going into 23 is, is going to be dedicated to that preliminary engineering piece, not for construction funding. Thank you for the clarification. Appreciate it. Um, Kyle. Okay. Um, Karen. If you'd like to unmute yourself. Yes. Hi. Okay. Karen Bates from the Agency of Natural Resources Watershed Planner um, for the area. And um, just wanted to let you know that we've been concerned about Allen Brook, which is a recipient of a lot of the stormwater, not just from Route 7, but the developed area. And it's a potential in the not too distant future if we can't um, improve or, or find some ways to manage stormwater and, and improve the aquatic biota habitat, that it could be um, identified as stormwater impaired, which is a harder thing for property owners, including the VTRANS. Um, there are, I, I see a couple of areas on the Route 7 corridor right around the Col Colchester Milton border and a little bit above and below where there's stormwater being directed underneath Route 7 and then it ends up um, providing or resulting in a fair amount of erosion perhaps to get to Allenbrook and Allenbrook is a mess there. So my ask is that if there are any opportunities for, to manage stormwater. It's sandy soil, so it's an easy thing to do. You've got a right of way uh, that that be incorporated in, especially where there are those areas um, of uh, are culverted stormwater through to more eroded areas. And the garage, that area uh, has a, a, a gully close to it. So I know that might just be something that I talked to that District 5 there. Yes. Um, about how best 
we could or we could work together to manage that stormwater reduce in volume but I and I think there are a lot of the chlorides are pretty high there as well based on the chemistry we've done perfect I would love to touch base with you um, either after this meeting or another time to go exactly to where the issues are and one thing I can also share is that um, I was talking to other parts of VTrans, um, the stormwater side, and we were, we are connecting and thinking into how this plan can connect with the phosphorus control plan. Um, okay. So it is kind of already in our radar on how to connect into existing processes and things that VTrans are trying to <laughs> achieve improvements on, um, including culverts and those things. So I'd love to connect with you more, um, Karen. This is great information. Thank you. Um, Kyle. Thanks. Um, sorry about before. I just wanted to um, provide a little clarification from Bethany's comment. Um, I was in that meeting and there was kind of a general consensus of our question about the slab removal was the um, uh, we were questioning if the slab removal was in of the portion of Route 7 that is north of the dam in Milton and to South Georgia. And our question was, why would you choose an area if it was in fact that area? Why would you choose an area that is, to our understanding, significantly less traveled than say an area of Georgia center to St. Albans? which has very heavy traffic and until we you know got you know were bestowed a blessing of some pavement last summer um the road was so horrendous you know it was nothing but the biggest talk of you know around so that was i think that that was kind of the question of you know what how are these decisions made or or you know what's being taken into consideration when choosing an area that's great to understand that context. Um, it definitely goes back to asset management. So what Matthew, um, Matt and um, Shane were talking about earlier. Um, but I can also just make sure that Bethany gets a more solid answer to go back to the tag because it's a very good, it's a very specific question to two very specific areas. Um, I'll get back to you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so any, um, so Milt, I would love to hear, um, I know Dave, you mentioned about the hourglass. I'd been hearing a lot about um, extensions to sidewalk connections and things like that. Is, do you have any additional context you might be able to provide um, about kind of where you're heading or maybe we could connect and you could just send me a document or two. I would love to know kind of, Milton's doing some great work and I'd love to recognize it and kind of put it in paper, if that makes sense. Yeah, we just finished the sidewalk gap project, which connected our sidewalks from Nancy Drive out to Haydenbury, which is good. We've been doing some more sidewalk work internally within town um, to try and help the, the school kids get across some of our busier roads. I don't have another one specifically on Route 7 that we're looking at right now, um, but you know, we're, we're still evaluating, so. Okay, great. Sorry, I'm just pausing so I can write down so I can make sure I'm really listening. Um, I do have the recording, but it's helpful to really make sure I understand. Thank you, Dave. That's helpful. You're welcome. I was going to thank Karen for bringing up Allen Brook because we don't want that one to go down the impaired pathway. Yeah, that doesn't sound like fun. Sounds quite scary. So we're going to move on from this, but if you remember something related to this, come up later, feel free to just give me a buzz. So starting to prioritize. Um, as I mentioned before, keeping it real and actionable is really important in this plan, so it doesn't become shelf candy. Um, I, I like our plans to be actionable and was to make progress. Um, I don't like my plan to sit on the shelf and just collect dust. Um, and also, it's not just be trans to implement. So we'll just remember those two principles as we go through this. So as I mentioned with the slab removal project, um, we're trying to keep this focused and moving. So then um, what I've done in the next few slides is I have these kind of little thought processes on the right hand side, so the little like bubbles. That gives you some kind of background um, that you might want to keep in mind. Um, and on the left hand side is more questions and comments. Um, so so sl the slab removal project, um, I spoke with um, Math, Matt and with Jesse Devlin, who's the head of the paving program and got a little more context of what could be included in this. Um, it's all subject to kind of what's on the ground and what can be pos is possible. Um, 
but one of the things we're looking at is wider or more consistent widths of um, shoulders. Um, that is often possible if there's enough base underneath it that you're not kind of falling off the edge. Um, some minor culvert replacements could be in there. Some small changes to geometries, like how you travel through an intersection. If there's a small change to make that curve just a little bit more friendly. Um, you could also maybe add a turn lane if it's warranted, um, but they can definitely evaluate to see if a turn lane addition could be part of the project. Um, also adding crosswalks, because in reality, a crosswalk is mostly just putting paint on a roadway. We have to make sure it meets all the VTrans standards. But crosswalks, I think, is a great opportunity for this corridor, um, particularly in the Milton area. Um, so we're going to discuss that more later. Um, and also just adding bike lanes or just wider shoulders to take bikes. Um, that is also a possible uh, possibility in some areas. Um, another piece of context is various things could be coordinated in with the project. So you could try and do it at the same time if you can get the timing to line up. Um, so things like drainage and streetscape improvements. Um, sometimes it's beyond what you can fit into a slab removal, but you're already digging up the road once. Why not dig it up all at the same time and just make a bigger hole um, that you can fill in? So that's a little bit more context with slab removal. So I'd really love to discuss um, crosswalks more. Um, this is something Excuse that, me. yep. Just before you uh, proceed, uh, I'm not sure you want to address questions now, but Dave Allerton had a question about how thick the slabs are to be removed. Uh, just to be aware, we have water, sewer, and other utilities to be uh, in the area. So uh, I don't know if you want to address that now or wait till the end of this section, but just wanted to call that out. I have no idea. If Matt has an idea, then he feel free to speak up. Otherwise, I can do my research. Yeah, so I'll, I'll preface this with the caveat that we have not done a geotechnical investigation on this project yet, so we, we don't have any hard numbers. Um, what we've been seeing on other projects with roughly the same age slabs is they're somewhere in the 7 to 10 inch range um, underneath varying depths of pavement. So uh, a lot of cases we're seeing somewhere in the four to six inches of pavement on top of slabs. Sometimes it's a little bit thinner. Other times the slabs have fallen off and, and it's a lot thicker. Um, and generally speaking, the slabs tend to be in that, you know, seven to 10, seven to 11 inch range um, in, in depth underneath that pavement structure. But again, that will be confirmed when we when we get going with the project and we do a geote geotechnical investigation. Thank you very much. And while I'm in the chat box, I also see Ashley requested that I be involved. Um, she is involved in the meeting with Karen about stormwater near the garage. And yes, definitely. Um, so um, Karen, in case you didn't know, Ashley is um, part of the District um, 5 staff. So um, she is a good person to have in the meeting. So. OK, um, so moving back to crosswalks. Um, I would love to hear from you as you are in the area. I know you know a lot more about this corridor than I do. I, where are you current, commonly seeing pedestrians? Um, where are they going from and to? And where are you commonly trying to see them cross the road? Because I do know that there aren't that many crosswalks along. There's like two, three mile section of Milton where there's maybe one or two crosswalks. So one thing that um, we would love to know is where would crosswalks be useful? Um, once we know where they might be useful, we can run some analysis to check whether they will pass our standards. And this is what I really want to know. So starting with you guys, I want to hear your thoughts. And then I'm planning to do a public survey. Um, and then I'm going to hear from the wider general public about where they think crosswalks would be useful for them. So, so this is Dave and Milton again. We've recently put in some some rectangular rapid flashing beacons at some crosswalks. One's at Nancy Drive. The other one is um, it's closer to Landfill Road, not quite there. And then there's one at Bombardier. And then we put in the, the RFBs at Rebecca Lander and Lamoille Terrace, where those crosswalks were. OK. And those those all went in in the last couple of years. Some of them just this past year. Do you have do you know if the town has plans to install any in, in addition to that or that's that was achieving the goal of what they wanted to do? That 
that achieved it of what we wanted to do. We're we're still kind of debating what we need to do on Route 7 and Main Street at okay. the bottom of the dam there. And there, we do need to put another crosswalk near Cherry Street too <clears throat> by River Street Park because that's people have brought that up as people tend to cross there and there's there's really no good place to cross. They just it's like playing Frogger right there. Yeah, and we don't want that, right? Nope. <laughs> okay, so you said um, in the main street area, because that's where you were also considering, like, do you even put in a roundabout or do you change the intersection geometry? Yeah. Um, yeah, and then there's, and then you also mentioned Cherry Street slash. Yeah, the street. bottom of Cherry Street right by River Street Park. Okay. That would Great. be a good place for something. Are there any others on people's radar? Any particular areas? Okay, um, Kyle, you have your hand up. Sorry. Uh, yep, I just wanted to say that um, in where Georgia is concerned, um, and maybe this is in part further along in your presentation, but um, you know we're hoping that we can pick back up our South Village um, transportation. Um, look to kind of see what um, is out there. There is on the, um, in front of the town currently a proposal for um, a pretty large construction project that is essentially at the corner of Ballard Road and Route 7 um, that has a, a large number of housing units and things like that, um, which is also somewhat controversial in town. But um, if that does go ahead, I'm, I would say that certainly there needs to be some type of crosswalk installed because it is the what I understand um, the intent that people would be able to, you know, start turning this area into a walkable village um, situation. And if people are expecting to be able to walk across the road to buy groceries or other goods, then we'll be in a in quite a mess. Okay, great. And that's good to have on our radar, particularly like Chris Clow is on the, um, this call from the perspective of Act 250, because sometimes improvements, like if it's to do with an intersection, would actually fall upon the developer. But sometimes it's something where we need to coordinate and knowing that a project is coming, putting in a crosswalk is a small thing to do. So um, thank you. That's great information to know it's coming. So. Of course. And I, I'm mainly focusing on in the sidewalk on the crosswalk question. I'd mainly be focusing on Milton just because it was on my radar as being a issue, big issue. I can add questions about Georgia specifically, Kyle. If you want, like you, you yourself and I and Bethany can like say, okay, which areas might maybe be useful there. Um, I would love to hear that because um, I I had not realized the crosswalks were also going to be needed in the um, Georgia area. Well, the Georgia project is it's unfortunate in that it kind of accumulated as COVID began and the entire project was dropped off. There was a lot of changeover with the select board and other things and then these projects that kind of pop up and down. So it's a weird it's kind of like all fallen into no man's land, um, okay. you know, and it is on the town's radar, but it's you know, it's not like the town of Georgia doesn't have a lot of opportunity to change parts of Route seven. So I think that that gets forgotten, um, you know, as some of the boards, you know, are approving or things are coming up in town. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons um, Chris Carr, I think, is on this call is because it's useful to him to know what's might might be coming and things like that. So thank, thank you. you. This is great. Um, anything else on crosswalks? If not, we'll move on to the next topic. OK, we can always go back to crosswalks if needed. Um, so intersection improvements. I was definitely hearing loud and clear there are several intersections in both Milton and Georgia which do not have projects assigned. So they do not have, for example, the Chimney Corners um, big project um, funding assigned. But there's definitely a need, a concern, there's energy, there's strategizing um, in terms of what we'd like to see coming up. Um, so um, I would love to hear informally from everyone in this room. What do you see as your priorities um, in terms of these intersections? So two, to give you a little context, two of these intersections came up through VPSB2. 
So the Vermont project prioritization and project selection um, process. Um, it's how we prioritize what gets capital funding. Um, so two projects came out through that. So that's the area around West Milton Road, Bartlett area, and that came out through Chinon County RPC. And then the area around exit 18 Skunk Hollow Road that came out through Northwest. But when reading the plans, I noticed these other intersections, which are listed on the screen right now, came up as notable conversations. What's going on? We're trying to understand it. We see there are issues or potential issues that could come up in the future. Um, so my question to all of you is, what do you see going on? Do you see there's a priority between these particular intersections? Or is there one, another high profile one I totally missed off the map? Um, so I'd love to just discuss this for five, 10 minutes um, and hear what you think. Well, this is Dave up in Milton again. Um, the first one there, Bartlett Road, West Milton Road, Legion Road and Racine Road. Yeah, that's all those roads kind of come together in a strange way. And I know that's on the CCRPC's radar right now. And that one definitely needs some kind of work. Bombardier Road, that one's a little more difficult. I know we've got, as you're going southbound, there's a no left turn sign there. People like to turn left there, but that's kind of a tough spot too, because we, when we put our new sidewalk in there, we had to re, um, we put in a, we shored up the slope on the ravine to the north there. So there's not a whole lot of real estate to work with there. Um, Rebecca Lander, that one goes into the high school. That's the one that we just finished doing some crosswalk and stormwater work on. The school, it's, it's a tight turn for the school buses and they always tear up the right of way. We tried to widen it just a little bit for them. It seems to be working for now, but if we can figure out something else to do, that would be okay. Lamoille Terrace and Barnum Street, it's those, and on the west side of Lamoille Terrace, we did fix the, the stormwater issue that we were having over there. So that one seems to be okay. That one would not necessarily be a high priority. The Barnum Street intersection with Route 7, yes, that one still has stormwater issues that we need to deal with. In fact, all of the intersections on the east side of Route 7 going through the downtown or village area are bad and need some kind of work. And then the, the Main Street um, and Route 7, yeah, that's just kind of a, a strange intersection. And I, I understand that it goes back to the old days when the, the prior bridge was over there and, you know, everybody was living with horses and wagons and now we've got big trucks and stuff and having to deal with it. But yeah, we need to probably figure out something better to do there. But the, the, there's, I know there's two buildings there that are pretty close to the road, so I'm not sure there's going to be much we can do. That's really helpful. I think I kept up with the notes on that. Just about. Yeah, one, I will listen one, to the recording. <laughs> once everybody gets into this, I'm happy to go out there and walk all these sites with you. That might that might be useful. Um, and I'm sure useful. I'm sure that would happen at some point during the design phase of this anyway. Yeah, and I, I think actually just what you mentioned about the design phase. So um this project is really the beginning. It's like a planning, it's like that surface level identifying where the issues might be. The next step, um, if there, as long as there's time and funding available, um, we would actually do what's called a new project summary, which just does a slightly deeper dive. Um, so right now I might identify there's 20 culverts that might need attention. And then in the new project summary, they'll say, okay, but these five are realistically gonna fit into the project, um, into a very particular project that it's feeding towards. And then obviously it goes into design and then you get into even more details. Um, so yes, um, sometimes I will be like, yes, that's good enough information for me to move on and know that there's a next step. Um, and other times I will actually dig in further to make sure that I understand the breadth. Because um, what I do in this corridor management plan sometimes is I flag things and I say, hey, I don't know what the solution is, but when you do attack, attack this area, please make sure you pay attention to X, Y, and Z because so and so has mentioned that it's really important in this area. Um, so that's the kind of thing we do. Um, Cool, so we've heard a little bit about, I don't know if people have additional 
um, input on the Milton side, but I'd also love to hear um, Georgia. Well, I think okay. you're or Jim, there. if you have input. <laughs> oh, no, 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 I'm oh. sorry. <laughs> so, okay, um, anything um, on the um, Georgia side, or does anyone have kind of preferences about how things align between both Milton and Georgia? Because they're not, they're one corridor, they're not two towns, <laughs> so. Uh, any thoughts or feelings? Kyle here from Georgia. So, I mean, I think that just back to my kind of previous comments, the the Georgia area is a very is a very small. All of these projects, your you know Ballard Road 104A and the you know 18 northbound and southbound exits are all within a, about a quarter mile. Um, so it's it's very much a. I think that anybody that I've spoken to, you know, kind of feels that these all kind of hinge, you know, one to the next to the next, um, because they are directly going to affect the next intersection. Um, it all needs some sort of some sort of work and some sort of planning. Um, but that's where I mean, I think that that master plan is really going to be, you know, the only way that we can kind of figure out to move forward the the plans about the potential roundabout or or traffic lights, you know, there again um, for the 104A intersection really, you know, that really makes a big difference and is going to directly impact Ballard Road and, you know, exit 18. So that's really helpful, not only to validate that the master plan really is the way you want to head, but also to hear that, to be honest, don't try and separate them, keep them together. <laughs> that's right. a helpful perspective. So. Um, Georgia Zoning. Sorry, I can't remember what your name oh, is. Oh, sorry, I didn't change my name. This is Emily Johnson, the Zoning Administrator for the Town of Georgia. Um, I apologize, I popped in a little late, so I don't know if this is already discussed, but with Georgia, I just want to note, um, and Kyle may have mentioned this, kind of this area is the South Village. So this is kind of where in zoning we are really trying to focus on a lot of that concentrated uh, living and um, kind of commercial um, development in town so along with that one project we have this empty campground owned by a developer so there's potential for that to be developed right across the road on ballard road at some point potentially um so that kind of it is a very small area like kyle said so for us that's going to kind of be really key because there's a lot of that's where we want a lot of the business and concentrated new housing to be. Um, so those updates will be really kind of important for us there because the traffic, if all goes according to the zoning um, kind of outline, will be increasing over the next X amount of years. So I think being proactive to kind of plan for that or at least know that that's where the town of Georgia wants to go for that area would be would be helpful to at least have that recorded or in the back of someone's mind. Yeah, great, great. And that's something that like I love the I love muscle 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 vision. It was really good. Really good. At and then I think there are other opportunities kind of looking at kind of like better connections and other um, projects where can you start putting like ashy things onto the road? So this is good. Um, thank you so far for all of that. We're going to move on from intersections just to keep us moving. But as always, bring it up if you remember something later on. So other things, um, we've got some other people on this call who are not just about roadways. Um, I know we've got um, some people from Green Man Transit and others. Um, are there any other mobility needs that should be considered along this roadway? Um, things to do with like, for example, transit stops. Is there a location that you really want a transit stop, but right now you can't easily stop there because there's not a pull off? Um, so in future, in an ideal world, could you put one in, for example? Um, are there access management issues where, hey, could you pay attention to this? Um, are there areas where you see a lot of bicycle usage that, hey, it would be good if we had a particular um, facility to more safely accommodate bicycles in that area? So. Uh, Jamie. Hi, uh, Jamie from Green Mountain Transit. Um, I just we we have not gotten very far on this idea yet there are no current locations where i think um we have looked to put a step where there isn't maybe a, a location for that but 
internally we are exploring an option of combining our St. Albans Link Express bus and our Milton commuter bus um, and just having a service that would run along Route 7 between um, you know Winooski and and St. Albans. Um, so you know we haven't gone very far down that that rabbit hole just yet um, but that will certainly have an impact I think on this project so we'll continue to engage um, once we start to explore that a little more. Great, thank you. Um, and also just think about if there's an existing stock where it's not quite ideal. I worked for a transit company for 18 months and it's amazing the small things like that particular curb is really in the wrong place and we're losing tires or I can't get my bus back out into the traffic because of X, Y and Z. So please never change this. Yeah, um, <laughs> just think about those small things that I know can make your operational life and your drivers so much happier. So. Sure. Yes, we will think about that. Cool. Anything else on these kind of topics um, other than the normal cars and buses um, and trucks and things like that? Uh, you know, at Gmail, I had to change everything. They locked me out of my Gmail. It's like gone. Okay. Um, in that case, we're going to move on. Um, so we already started to talk a little bit more about drainage, um, stormwater, and environmental. Um, I appreciated Karen bringing up what she brought up earlier. Um, and I would love to hear more from you um, about are there any other needs that should be considered um, like wildlife crossings, rare endangered species, water quality, anything else that could fall under this kind of heading. Um, I did involve um, invite Jens and he could not attend. So I'll be getting information about the wildlife crossing kind of side of things um, on the side afterwards. Um, but does anyone on this call have any particular input on any of this, these topics. Um, Danielle. Thanks. Um, so just so you know, the background of Deer Brook is that it is on the 303D list, so it's an, considered an impaired waterway. Um, it is not considered impaired for stormwater at this point. But I think it's really important that any management along the corridor or any runoff that would be discharging towards Deer Brook is looked at really closely. Um, we have had some monitoring, water quality monitoring done in 2019 and 2020 that's showing really high chlorides potentially in the chronic levels, especially towards the end of the season when things get a little drier. Um, so we're not sure yet how much that is having an impact to the aquatic biota in that area, which has been kind of up and down in terms of being able to meet our water quality standards. So I just think it's really important to consider anything that's going to be discharging um, to Deer Brook and that in general, that area is all part of, you know, as Karen was saying earlier, is all part of uh, Sandy Delta. So it's just really erodible. Um, so any increase in volume, but I, you know, I know that most of the, any of this work will be going through stormwater permitting, um, especially with VTRANS, but, you know, just a consideration for that. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, Dave Allerton says, where is Deerbrook? Um, so Deerbrook is running, my understanding, um, around where the 104 X, um, the 104 intersection near X18 in Georgia. And that's where there's a big gully and then Deerbrook runs kind of down kind of almost parallel um, to Route 7 going down um, as far as I think the lake. It actually runs so it runs parallel along Route 7 and then it goes more parallel with Route 104A and then goes into Arrowhead Mountain Reservoir um, where they just did I think that bridge or culvert replacement and um, that's where Deerbrook crosses into Arrowhead. Thank you, Daniel. You know better than I do. <laughs> Any other questions or comments um, about drainage, stormwater, and environmental factors? In that case, we'll move on. Um, so just um, to give a little bit more context, well, we've talked a lot about construction and putting shovels in the ground kind of thing. Um, I think this plan also will benefit from 
thinking about non-construction needs, partnerships, collaborations, and also things where it's changing the rules. So it sounds like, for example, Georgia is doing a lot of work to try and concentrate its development in South Georgia Village. Um, and that's about regulations rather than actually doing construction. Um, another thing which I know has been part of the discussions at some points in the past is the idea of class one town highway, um, a conversion from state highway to town one um, to class one, um, particularly for the stretch in Milton, but maybe also for the stretch in Georgia. Um, so I'd say keep that on your radar um, because I think it could be an avenue forward in the future. Um, class one town highway has pros and cons. Um, as everyone knows, and there is a white paper that gives a lot more information about what that could include. Um, another example of non-construction needs, um, I mentioned that this actually earlier, was um, there's a new phosphorus control plan coming out for VTrans lands, and I've actually been working with the consultant and VTrans staff to see how we can coordinate this corridor management plan with what they're trying to achieve through that plan. Um, so that's a co-benefit. They're already doing the work and we're just going to make sure it gets tied in. Um, so with this in mind, are there any other partnerships, coordination efforts or ways in which we need to talk to each other better? Um, make sure we touch base. Um, what are your thoughts? Are there areas where you don't know about something, but you would love to connect in, for example? Could be the other way around. It could be I don't have something to volunteer, but I'd like to know what's going on. Um, Danielle. Yeah, one more thing I forgot about. I don't don't know if it would like fall into this area or not, but they, I think in 2019, I can't remember, whenever the Halloween storm was, they replaced or relined the culvert under the exit ramp that Deer Brook flows through above 104A. And so the, the outlet of that culvert, um, is they had to kind of redo the whole thing and it looked like they kind of poured concrete in and I think it was like an emergency fix but it's it has altered the hydrology there a bit which is a little concerning there's kind of like a like I said there's a it's kind of cemented in there with a bunch of boulders and there's a big pool and we went to do water quality sampling and the water quality there just like isn't looking very good because it just sits and it was very algae and so there's some opportunities maybe to improve that outfall there um so i don't know if it could be part of this project but it's something that i think would be important because I, I do think that outfall could be improved and i think the rivers program would be willing to help to look at that or do a site visit at some point this year if that was possible if you could send me an exact location and what structure it is, um, I think that sounds like a great thing to include um, okay. the coordination. And I think um, I love the idea that, of coordination as well between VTrans and a &R, So um, it'd be great. Great. Okay. Anything else from everyone? Okay. In that case, I'm going to move on to next steps and then we'll just have general discussion, general comments and any other questions you might have. Um, I realize we've been at this for a while now um, and we are close to the end, I promise. So next steps. Um, one of the next steps is, can you help? Um, I am only as good as the information that I get from people. Um, I'm a planning coordinator. I'm not the expert. I know how to find the resources. So. Um, for example, um, do you have sidewalk GIS data that you could share with me? Um, maybe Dave, you might have that. Also, do you have information about a construction project that I'm not aware of that we should at least mention within the plan? Another thing is I'm preparing for the next step, which is public outreach. And we can do the old style of public outreach, which is I, I send out an email um, to the few people who I know in town, which is not very many people. Um, and we maybe put an ad in the newspaper, which nobody reads. The alternative is, I would love to hear from you. Who are key community leaders or people who look after the French Porch Forum or look after an email listserv or have a Facebook group that has a good connection to the local community? If you have those connections, if you could pass them along to me, I would love to have them because I'd love to mobilize existing connections into the community so that I can share the survey and information about this plan directly with the community via the existing places they already go for information. 
Um, so I would love it if you could share whatever context you have and feel free to say, hey, this is the person I need to touch base with them. Um, but this is what I want to plan to do. I would just love to hear from you. In terms of time frame, I would love to get the survey out kind of the beginning to middle of February. Um, so if you could get things to me in the next two weeks, that would help me to know what I'm trying to plan around and what I'm trying to plan with. Um, so, for example, um, one of the CCRPC staff connected with someone in the Milton School to, um, school, um, is, who's a teacher um, today, and that'll be great because she already has some connections that will be a really useful um, jumping off point. So if you could connect me with the right people, um, just feel free to email or give me a call. That would be really helpful. You can also mention them today on the call, but you don't have to. Feel free to just email me. Um, and at this point, um, I'm pretty sure this is the last slide. Um, OK, we'll do this and then we'll go back to general discussion. So what comes next? Um, obviously, you have a chance to have a look through what um, I shared with you today. Um, the corridor management plan, as is in the story map. Um, if you could provide feedback within the next two weeks, um, let's say um, I'll send you an email and I'll give you a date. Um, probably like two and a half weeks from now, it'll be like a Friday. Um, so basically at the end of January, if you could get back to me, that would be helpful. Then I will do public outreach, which will include a survey and information about the plan. They will see the same story map you have, so they'll have the same information. And then after that, we'll review next steps um, internally within VTrans as well as with you as partners. And then we'll finalize the plan. And then the idea is this plan does not sit in the shelf. Hopefully it's being implemented and then we'll also check in on it two years from now and say, hey, have we made progress on X, Y, and Z? Or do we need to alter the next step to better reflect what's happened? Um, so. Um, so that's not comes next. And at this point, I would say any other questions or comments, um, thoughts, people you'd like to connect with. Um, yeah, that's my. Kent, I love your description about falling off a 60 foot drop. <laughs> it's quite amazing that drop. Um, um, about describing where Daybrook is. So, okay. Any other thoughts? Um, yeah. Well, in that case, definitely feel free to reach out to me. Um, email me, call me, um, or if you want, I'll stay on the line for an extra five ten minutes in case you have a random thought that comes up. I really appreciate each and every one of you coming out today. Um, it's been great to hear from you. It's also been great to share information about the project. I know I have given you a lot of information um, and I know it will take time to digest. So digest it and get back to me. And to be honest, if you missed the deadline of the end of this month to get stuff back to me, still reach out. This plan is not going to be final and there's always ways for me to slide things in. It's just not ideal not to have everything at the last minute. Um, but reach out at any point. And if you think, hey, there was so-and-so missing from the meeting today, we should have invited them. Let me know and in the future, I will make sure I invite them. Um, so this plan is best if you help me to make this a good plan. So thank you all. I will give you an extra 10 minutes or more of your time. Thank you, Catherine. This Thanks, was Catherine. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you.